This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, professional training, patient care, and community service. As a nonprofit organization at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine, our research and educational outreach activities are made possible by the generosity of private donors. It is our vision that successful aging will be an achievable goal for everyone. To learn more, please visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu. I hope that you find this enjoyable. I really enjoy talking about what I do, so I'm going to have a good time. Um, now, when uh, my wife, who was a practicing audiologist and take care of patients, saw what I was talking about, she said, you better make it pretty clear that you're not a real doctor. <laughs> so, full disclosure, I'm a mouse doctor. <laughs> I don't re deal with people. What I do is I work with mice and rats and other things in the laboratory. And uh, our goal is to try and figure out, uh, first of all, what could be some new medical therapies for hearing loss? What can we understand about hearing loss, how it happens and how it might be prevented and how it might be treated once it happens? So, you know, what I'm gonna be telling you about this evening is not uh, what can be done for you today. We're working with what may be the cures for tomorrow. And uh, so well, that's what I'd like to tell you a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the mechanisms of hearing loss, you know, how the ear works and what it looks like and then how it goes bad. And then I'd also like to tell you about the work we're doing to try and develop new therapies for the ear. Now, hearing imbalance problems are extremely common. About one in 10 or more Americans has some difficulty with hearing loss that's significant enough to cause a problem in their life or to require treatment. And 25 million Americans experience tinnitus or tinnitus, depending on whether you're from one side of the Atlantic or the other. And uh, many of those individuals suffer from this. Uh, some, you know, I would say the majority of individuals who have tinnitus or tinnitus um, aren't particularly bothered by it. But there's a subpopulation of people that are driven to distraction and it can be extremely annoying for them and even life-threatening because people have in the past committed suicide over this. So this, you know, is a serious problem, although, uh, you know, it might not sound that way. And more than 8 million Americans have chronic balance problems. And, and chronic balance problems are, you know, a really big issue because they contribute to falls. And, uh, you know, not only that, but they, you know, if they're severe, they can prevent you from having any quality of life whatsoever. One of the physicians in our department did a quality of life study about Meniere's disease, which is, you know, primarily a problem of balance. And he found that the quality of life was degraded to the point of a person who is dying from cancer. I mean, if, if you are in a severe attack from Meniere's disease. So it can be a very debilitating condition. So both hearing and balance can really cause problems for your life in terms of your communication, in terms of your ability to function, and in terms of your ability to enjoy what you're doing. And as I mentioned, the falls, uh, which can come with uh, problems in vestibular issues, are a major cause of disability, especially for the elderly, where falls are, uh, are particularly a problem. So what are the causes of hearing vestibular sores? Well, that's a complicated question, and there are many, many causes, so I can't go into all of those. But they are typically related to damage to the ear rather than damage to the higher centers of the brain that cause problems in hearing. That's not true always, but the great majority are. And that damage is usually to the cells that are responsible for taking sound and turning those into the neural impulses that the brain can interpret. And those are the sensory cells, and these are called hair cells, and they have nothing to do with the hair up here. Although I work on hair cells, I've, told, I've always been told I'd make a lot more money if I could find a way to grow this hair rather than the other kind of hair cell. But uh, I work with the ones that are in the ear and are responsible for the sensation of hearing imbalance. And then, of course, those sensory cells are hooked up to neurons that transmit information to the brain. And those are the also you know, very important components. 
And the important thing to remember about these cells is that once we lose them, they're gone. They don't come back. You can't regrow them. Now, birds can regrow them, which is, seems unfair to me. You know, does a bird need the new ones that much? You know, what, what are they going to listen to? But, you know, they, they're the ones who are lucky. And, uh, you know, we ended up with the short end of that stick. So understanding how these cells are damaged is really the first step to developing therapies that can prevent the loss of hair cells or can restore function if they're not com you know, completely damaged and lost. Um, and I'm going to be talking about that uh, a little bit later. But first, what I want to do is explore with you um, the structure and the function of the ear, how it works, how it's put together, and so that we can understand a little bit better uh, how the, uh, the ear cells are damaged and what we might be able to do about them. So this is a, a, a diagram that shows you the anatomy of the ear. And you can see that it begins on the outside with what you can see, the pinna. Then there's the ear canal. We're all familiar with that. That's the thing you're not supposed to put anything inside of. And uh, that ends in the eardrum. Then we have the middle ear, which is a little air-filled space that causes problems when you're on the airplane and it gets plugged up. And then there's bones in the ear that lead towards the inner ear here. And that is a fluid-filled organ that, in which all of the cells I've just been talking about live, the hair cells and the neurons. And then the eustachian tube connects the air of the middle ear to your throat. And so when that gets blocked, you can end up with pressure that accumulates in here and causes a problem in hearing. So the middle ear that we're talking about here um, is this connector between the outside world and the inside world of the inner ear where the cells are, are happening. And it has three bones, you know, the, the hammer, the incus, and the anvil. And, uh, or the stapes, rather. But I want you to pay particular uh, attention to two structures. One is the eardrum itself, the tympanic membrane, because that's the access to the ear. You have to go through the tympanic membrane to get at the ear, unless you want to do a really big surgery. And then from between the middle ear and the inner ear is a little structure called the round window. And that's got a very thin membrane over that. And that is the easiest access to get to the inner ear from the middle ear. And these are just things I want you to note because I'll be talking about those later when we come to the idea of how you might get treatments from the outside into the ear. Now, the cochlea is a spiral. Um, and that's because it's very long. The cochlea has a very long length and it codes frequencies from one end to the other. And the longer it is, the better of a job it can do. But it doesn't fit inside your head very well. So what's happened is that the ear has developed a spiral. And so if you look at the human cochlea, there are two and a half turns in that spiral. And there are neurons in here, and the sensory cells are out here. The guinea pig has an even longer cochlea. I'm not sure why. They're smaller than we are. But they have four and a half turns. And uh, you can see that here. Now. Within the inner ear is a little structure called the organ of Corti, named after an Italian who discovered it many hundreds of years ago. And that contains uh, the sensory cells, and it sits on a structure called the basilar membrane. So this is just a thin, flexible membrane, and the sensory cells sit on top of that. <coughs> and these are the little stereocilia, or hairs. This is why we call them hair cells. So, you know, they're not really hairs, they're just little cilia that stick up like this, but they're very important to how the sensory cells work. And you can see that there are four different cells in each location in the cochlea, one of what we call the inner hair cell, and three of what we call the outer hair cell, because this is the outside edge. And they have very different functions that we'll talk about. And also, they have very different sensitivity to damage. The outer hair cells are the first cells that are lost in any form of damage to the ear. They're much more sensitive than the inner hair cells. They're also very important to how the ear works, as we'll see. So this is a, an electron micrograph at many, many thousands of, amp of uh, magnification of an inner hair cell. Here are the little cilia up at the top. And down at this end are nerve endings. And so what this cell's job is, is to pick up vibrations of sound and to turn them into impulses in the neurons here. And those nerve fibers then lead into the brain and tell the brain what's going on. 
This is the outer hair cell, one of those three that are at each location in the inner ear. And these are the cilia. These are nerve endings down here, but look how different it is. It's very long and it's not surrounded by other cells, it's surrounded by fluid. So it's got a completely different structure, what would make you think it might have a different way of operating. And this is what happens, what the, the sensory epithelium looks like if you take the outer covering off of the cochlea, take away the bone and some of the outer tissue, and you look at just the epithelium itself. When I said it's coiled so that we can fit this long organ into a small space, these are rows upon rows upon rows, thousands and thousands of hair cells. And these are the cells that we need to be able to hear. And if we look at these cells up close, we can see that the little cilia, the little hairs that are sticking up, are there by you know, 50 to 100 cilia per cell. So each one of these cells has an array and they're very regular and they're spaced like this. And you can, so you can get a good view of how complicated the structure is and how much care you know, has been taken by the designer of this structure to make sure that everything is in the right place, all lined up and ready to go. Okay, so here we are back again at a view, uh, this time a drawing of this uh, sensory epithelium or organ accordi. And you can see here the hair cells, there's your inner row and this is your outer row. The cilia stick up and they're embedded in this funny little piece of jelly called the tectorial membrane. It's really just a gelatinous structure that sits on top of the epithelium. Then we have nerve fibers that come like this and go down and enter the brain. So this is the working uh, structure that T turns sound into nerve impulses, and it sits on top of this strong, flexible basilar membrane. And that membrane can move up and down. And that's important because that is how the ear operates is basically the first thing that happens inside the inner ear is the movement of this membrane. So, how does the ear produce hearing? Step one. Well, actually, step one is the sound goes from your outer ear through the ear canal up to the eardrum. But then that sound encounters the eardrum and it vibrates the eardrum. And that, in turn, vibrates the bones that are present in the middle ear. That, in turn, pushes on the fluid inside the, the cochlea. And that causes the basilar membrane to move. So it goes up and down. And it releases uh, at the round window. Again, so the pressure comes in here, comes along here, bends this, and then because the pressure has to go somewhere, it pushes out this little membrane a little bit. And that just goes back and forth like this. And the membrane goes up and down like this. So, why is the basilar membrane so long? I mean, why do we need a long cochlea? And as I said earlier, that's because there's different frequencies that are placed at different portions along the inner ear. The high frequencies are at one end and the low frequencies are at the other. And because of the structure of that membrane, the, the, all of the frequencies are distributed along the length so that you know, it's going to take all the high frequencies at this point, the mid frequencies here, and the low frequencies here. And it does that simply by the structure of the membrane because at this end it's very stiff and at this end it's very floppy. And so you know how things are when they're stiff. If you, if you touch them, they go boing. And if they're floppy, you touch them, they go bong. And that's just how the ear works as well. So now that doesn't happen one at a time. All the frequencies are distributed along the ear at the same time. So I'm going to show you a little movie, assuming that the movie will work. And what that will do is, if uh, I'm lucky enough to get this thing going, here we are, okay. So now we're moving into the ear canal. We're seeing the eardrum moving in and out. Doesn't show up very well, but the bones are moving in and out. And here's the cochlea. Now what we're gonna do is unroll the cochlea so we can see it as a long structure. And then we see the basilar membrane. And this is that membrane that goes up and down. So you can see that all of those can happen at the same time and the, the, the frequencies go from one end to the other.
So you can see that the low frequencies were causing movement of the membrane here, and the high frequencies were causing movement of the membrane over here. And as, as the membrane is moving up and down, it's also moving the sensory cells. So this membrane that we showed like this in the diagram is actually fixed at the edges. So you get a bulge, basically, moving up and down within the inner ear. And that leads us to step three, which means that the up and down motion of this bulge that's in the basilar membrane causes the hair cells to move in such a way against this gelatinous membrane that they're bent. And it's the bending of the cilia that causes the cells to discharge the nerve fibers underneath them. And so this is the way the ear produces sound, is by converting the up and down motion of the basilar membrane into bending of the hairs on the cells and then into the discharges of the nerve. And then when that happens, there is a process uh, an electrochemical process whereby ions move into the cell, they change the voltage of the cell, and that then stimulates the nerve fibers and goes on in. So we've gone all the way from the outside of the head where we have sound vibrations into these chemical reactions that occur in the nerve fibers and send the information into the brain. And that's not the end of the story because the outer hair cells that I talked about, the long skinny ones, they have a separate job. It's a different function. They really are responsible for the most sensitive part of our hearing. So if you think in terms of how much, how much range do we have, they usually talk about it in terms of decibels. The lowest hearing, the sound that we can hear has an intensity of zero decibels. And there's a linear scale that goes up to where it turns into pain, and that's 120 decibels. And the bottom third is because of the outer hair cells. If we don't have the outer hair cells, we lose uh, the bottom third of our hearing capacity. And they're also very important for being able to discriminate frequencies of sounds. And that's critical too, because if you're in a situation where you need to you know, pick up one signal versus another, say you're in a, in a cocktail party, or in a crowded room, or you're on the beach and the waves are crashing, you know, if you don't have the outer hair cells, then you're gonna have more trouble understanding sound than if you did have them. And they have a really remarkable property, which is why this happens they actually change shape when they're stimulated by sound. And that shape change can amplify very faint sounds a hundred times. So this can, in fact, travel back through the middle ear and be heard in the ear canal, the sounds that are produced by these cells. So this is an example of a recording of sounds that are in the ear canal of a normal person. And each, this is frequency here and this is amplitude. And these are, each one of these are little tiny tones, faint tones that you really couldn't hear unless you had special microphones. But these are emanating from the cochlea and they're coming back out through the middle ear and being played by the eardrum almost as though it was a speaker. And these are sounds can be so loud that they can sometimes even be heard. When these were discovered, the first time that these were discovered was in England in the 1960s. There was a family who had a child who was waking his parents up by whistling in the middle of the night. He was about five. So they would go into his room and complain that he was whistling and he was asleep. They would start talking and they couldn't hear it anymore so they just assumed this was a problem. It went on for some time. And finally they figured out that he really, he kept saying, I'm not whistling, I'm not awake. They finally believed him. They took him to a doctor and a series of doctors couldn't figure out what was going on. And finally, they took him to an audiologist who put a microphone next to his ear, and his ear was producing sounds that were loud enough to hear in a quiet room. And it was just a pure whistling noise. And uh, so this was written up in an article as you know, just an amazing finding, and promptly ignored for 20 years. Nobody could believe that ears would make sounds. It's sort of like saying you're in a dark room and, and lights shooting out of your eyeballs. It just doesn't make any sense. But in fact, now what we know is that there's a molecule called Preston that sits in the membrane of these outer hair cells. And when the voltage changes in response to sound, it contracts and makes the cells move. And it doesn't move by very much, but it does move. And 
thousands and thousands of those cells moving together are enough to provide you know, that sound that we can hear in the ear canal. And I have a little movie again. And you can see here that the cell is changing how long it is. And this cell isn't getting any sound. All it's getting is some electric current that's the recording of this music that's coming down through this glass electrode and inside the cell. So this is how these cells are able to provide such exquisite sensitivity that we have compared to many other animals. It's because we have, I'm gonna turn that off because it's getting annoying. <laughs> but this, these little cells moving around like that are the reason why we have such exquisite hearing. And that, you know, for reasons we don't really understand, that amplification that, that we're getting from those cells only occurs in a little narrow region right at the right place for every cell. So if it's in the high frequency region of the cochlea, it amplifies a little high frequency area. And if it's in the low frequency end, it, it amplifies a little low frequency area. So it really contributes not only to our sensitivity, but to our ability to discriminate sounds one way and the other. And when we lose those cells, we lose that function. That's why they're so important. Okay, let's move on to the vestibular system. Uh, the vestibular system also has hair cells, and it operates in much the same way. But it operates much more slowly. It doesn't need to have the rapid responses that the ear has. And uh, it also has a very different way of being stimulated. So if you look at the vestibular portion of the ear, here's the cochlea here with its turns. Here's the vestibular portion of the inner ear. There are two divisions. One is the semicircular canals, these little loops. And the other is just a chamber called the vestibule. And that's why it's called the vestibular system, because when the anatomist looked at this hundreds of years ago, they said, well, wow, that's like the little vestibule inside the ear. They didn't really understand you know, what it was doing, but it looked that way. And it was the, the vestibule that led into these long curling chambers or into the long cochlea. And there are five sensory organs that are present in the vestibular inner ear. So three of these sensory organs are called the Christi, and they're responsible for detecting rotation of the head. And there are three semicircular canals that are at right angles to each other. And so no matter how you rotate your head, either like this or like this or like this, you're gonna stimulate one of those canals and one of those organs. That information is gonna to go to the brain and it's gonna, the brain is gonna say, okay, my head is moving, I better move my eyes so that they track along with my head. And their main job is to synchronize the movement of the head and the eyes. Um, if they get out of whack, like if you, you know, the eyes detect movement like you're on a boat and the vestibular system says, no, my head's not rotating, then bad signals get sent to the brain and you get seasick in a lot of people. Um, then there are two other organs called the maculae that are gravity detectors and they tell us where we are in space. They can detect gravity and they can, they can detect acceleration. So if we're in a car and put on the gas, you know, those are the organs that tell us we're moving forward. And if we're you know, up on the moon and there's no gravity or out in space, those are the organs that say, you know, we don't have any gravity and I feel really strange because again, you're used to having gravity all the time. So this is the macula structure and you can see it again consists of these little sensory cells that have hairs. They're longer than they are in the cochlea. And there's a gelatinous matrix like the cochlea, except in this case, fluid is moving along through the semicircular canal because you've rotated your head, it hits this gelatinous thing and bends the cells, the hairs of the cells, and they become activated. And they stimulate these nerve fibers. Now, the gravity uh, or acceleration detectors operate in a different way. Again, they have hair cells. Those cells have cilia. There's another gelatinous matrix. This seems to be the common theme in the ear. But these have little crystals on top and they sit on top of the gelatinous matrix and they act as weights. So when you, you know, turn your head like this, those little crystals pull this way. And when you're accelerating forward, those little crystals get left behind. And they cause that sensation of hair cells and that goes to the brain and the brain says, aha, I'm moving in a certain direction or I'm standing in a certain orientation relative to gravity. Okay, what about causes of hearing loss? I mentioned that it's the loss of the hair cells and the loss of the neurons that contribute 
to the loss of hearing. That's the majority of the loss of hearing. But why? I mean, what, what causes this? Well, there are a lot of factors that can produce hearing loss. And the most common, as we're probably all familiar with, is presbycusis. And that's because as you get older, your hearing declines. Your best hearing is when you're about two. When you're two years old, you can hear way up into high frequencies that you wouldn't even believe because by the time you're old enough to understand those frequencies, you can't hear them anymore. <laughs> but about 23,000 hertz or 23,000 cycles per second is what you can hear when you're a very, very young child. And that hearing, uh, first of all, the frequencies go down so that by the time you're 40, you're only down to, you're down to 16,000. By the time you're 60, you're down to 8,000. And then superimposed on top of that is a loss of sensitivity. So as you get older, there's, and that's an extremely common thing, you know, probably by the time you're 80 years old, 90% um, of people have some degree, measurable degree of hearing loss. And my wife says I'm early, so. So there are lots of different other causes, intense sound, can cause hearing loss. So if you're exposed to a lot of noise where you work or you've been in the military or you fire guns without the proper protection for your ears, then you're gonna end up with hearing loss. Um, certain genetic causes, diseases, will cause hearing loss. There are hundreds of genes that are responsible for how the ear is structured. If any of those are mutated, they can cause a hearing loss. It's estimated there are probably 500 genes that can do that although we've only identified about 60 or 70 of them. Um, certain drugs can cause hearing loss. Certain antibiotics that we don't use very often because that's what they do, and anti-cancer drugs. Now, if you have the choice between cancer and hearing loss, most people will say, give me the hearing loss and get rid of the cancer. So that's why they're used. And then finally, we have inner ear inflammation caused by viruses or immune responses, um, autoimmunity or you know, other immune disorders that can cause inflammation in the ear and that can cause hearing loss. That can occur very suddenly. Boom, you know, you're hearing fine one day and then boom, the next day you're not. Called a sudden hearing loss. And then middle ear infections or otitis media is another cause of hearing loss. Now in the United States, otitis media gets treated and it causes a problem. Children are unhappy and, you know, but typically it isn't, uh, you know, doesn't cause permanent large degrees of hearing loss. But in the developing world, that's not true it causes half of the world's burden of hearing loss is due to otitis media that doesn't get treated in the developing world. Now, most of these causes of hearing loss can also cause vestibular problems. So, you know, if those drugs that damage the ear um, will also cause losses in the vestibular system and cause vestibular problems. And, you know, if you look at uh, um, the genetic disorders that cause hearing loss, many of those also cause uh, vestibular problems. The one thing that doesn't is intense noise. But presbycusis, age-related also, you know, will damage the vestibular system over time. So in generally, as we age, our vestibular function tends to decline a bit. Okay, this is a, uh, a common slide that you see uh, about age-related hearing loss. Person at 20 years old is beginning to lose hearing around four to eight K, but it's not enough, or 8,000 8, hertz, it's not enough that you would really notice. Most audiologists would define 20 dB as normal hearing. If you're hearing better than 20 dB level, you're fine. By the time you're 40, you're beginning to, to get above that level. At 60, you can see that not only are you above that level, but the hearing loss is beginning to spread, as I mentioned, to lower and lower frequencies. And then by the time you're 90, you know, your frequency of your sensitivity at 8,000 hertz might be over 100 dB, close to the limits of hearing. Now, intense noise, as I said, causes hearing loss. So if you are listening to a dishwasher, TV, uh, a vacuum cleaner, an alarm clock, you don't have anything to worry about. You can go up to 85 dB and nothing is gonna happen. But if you're exposed to loud sounds of 85 dB all day long, that's where uh, the OSHA regulates the workplace, begins to take notice and say, wait a minute, this is getting a bit loud. You have to have hearing protection or you need to reduce the sounds. And then as you go on up, you can have you know, very, very high levels. And you can see that a really loud car stereo can be extremely damaging. Um, and we've now found that with insert earphones, the iPods, uh, and other personal listening devices can produce very high levels. 
And we are beginning to see in the clinics, you know, teenagers and young adults who have listened to too much loud sound on a personal listening device at too high an intensity and are coming in with hearing loss. Now, if you're standing next to the space shuttle 30 feet away, it's 200, but that's gonna be fatal from the space shuttle. But even if it weren't, the sound would kill you. I mean, that's, that's, that's the level. And right here is the threshold of pain between 120 and 130 dB. It's no longer sound. But, but the intensity can keep going right up. And you know, if you're, you have a rifle that's fired, a, a pretty good sized rifle it would have to be, not a 22, a few feet from your head, you know, that can be enough to cause hearing loss immediately. Okay, so as I said before, the most vulnerable elements are the hair cells. And you can see these are outer hair cells that have been destroyed by a loud sound. The inner hair cells are not as badly damaged, they're still there. But you've lost the most sensitive third of your hearing and a lot of your frequency discrimination ability because you've lost those outer hair cells. So what can we do about hearing loss? Well. You should take good care of your ears and start when you're young. Don't just wait, you know. So if you have uh, grandchildren, you know, out there who are listening to those personal listening devices, say, wait a minute. You know, you should be turning down the volume. If you're going to go to a rock concert, you should be wearing this. Now, that you will have done the right thing. They may not do the right thing, <laughs> with my experience with kids and grandchildren. But, you know, that's probably, you know, the best advice you could give anybody about hearing. It's just like taking care of your teeth. You know, you do that throughout your whole life, everything is going to be fine. If you don't, then you're going to pay the price. But what if your hearing's already damaged? What if it's not something you can do anything about? Because you can protect your ears from loud sounds, but you can't protect your ears from getting older. You can't protect your genetics. You know, they are what they are. So in those cases, we have to try and make some accommodation for that hearing loss. Um, that can be some form of something like a hearing aid. Now, hearing aids in the old days were basically horns and trumpets that you would turn around backwards and you would collect sound. You just have a great gigantic ear on either side of your head, and that was helpful. Um, nowadays, we have much better hearing aids, and uh, you know, I, I'm not the person to talk to you about how hearing, hearing aids work. I know a very small amount. But uh, you can go to an audiologist and uh, they can tell you, you know, what is the best kind of hearing aid, what their capabilities are. They now have digital processing that allows them to do things that we could never have done with them 20 years ago. So the hearing aid is advancing, you know, in its, uh, in its usefulness. Now hearing aids are particularly good if you have a problem with the middle ear so that you know, the inner ear hair cells are okay, all you've lost is a little bit of sensitivity because of a problem with the sound that's being transmitted from the external ear to the inner ear. And they can compensate almost perfectly for that, they're great. Now if you have hair cell loss and neural loss, they're also good, but they're not as good as they are for the other form of hearing loss because they can't compensate for those active hair cells that have lost that frequency selectivity, that frequency resolution capability. So you can make the noise louder, but it isn't gonna make your hearing normal again. It's going to, you're still gonna have trouble when you're in a, a, a noisy environment, like at the beach or in a, in a cocktail party. You, know, you won't be able to pick things out as well as you, know, uh, you used to be able to before you lost those hair cells. Now, if you're really totally deaf, they have another solution, the cochlear implant, that I'm sure all of you have heard about. And that's an electrical device. It's a series of electrodes that are threaded inside the cochlea. This works if you've lost all your hair cells, but you still have neurons. Because what they do is they electrically stimulate the neurons. And so the sound comes into a device in your ear. It's converted into electrical impulses that are sent into the inner ear. And they are an amazing device. They're wonderful. I mean, you know, if, you're, if you implant a child, you know, that child who used to grow up probably being able to sign and nothing else and very little speech or very distorted speech would be, you wouldn't even know that they were deaf. Um, again, it's not perfect. It doesn't make you normal. It makes you hard of hearing, but not so severely that you can't go to a regular school. So it's a really miraculous device. And I want to say that this is, you know, this is one of the great accomplishments of the science of hearing science and, and, and uh, the medical science of hearing is this device because it's done such a great thing for the deaf, especially when it's done young. Now, 
But those are the treatments that we have for hearing loss. They're, we don't have very much else. Um, now, what about the balance problems? Now, if you're like this poor guy and uh, you don't know what's coming next, what can you do? Well, there are a few things, not a lot. And, you know, this is a situation in which we're better at diagnosing these problems than we are at treating them. So, vestibular rehabilitation. They'll put you in a place where you can balance and learn, and you can, over time, learn to compensate for problems with balance. And this is quite effective. And in fact, if you work at it really hard, you can get to be really good. This guy can stand on one leg all day long, and never a problem. Of course, he can regrow his hair cells, and we can't, so maybe he's cheating. But there is another uh, way of getting hearing loss than loss of hair cells, and that's the otoliths that I was talking about, the little weights that sit on the, the vestibular epithelium can get loose, and they can go wandering off to the wrong part of the ear. And you can see that here. In this case, they normally live up here on one of the maculae, but they've gotten loose, and they're down here in this canal, and they're pushing up against the crystal. And they say, I'm turning my head, I'm turning my head, I'm turning my head, even though you're not. So that can cause real problems. And what they can do is they can reposition those through some techniques, one of which is called the Epley Maneuver. So they'll, you know, a, a hearing professional, a vestibular professional, will put you down and take you through a series of movements. And what they're trying to do is to take the debris that was sitting up against your canal and rotate your head so that it gradually moves around and then falls back into the area where the macula is. It's not going to go back on the macula and reattach itself, but at least it gets out of the semicircular canals where it's causing all that trouble. And so this can be effective as a treatment. And this is one of those cases where, you know, like maybe a problem in the middle ear, um, it's relatively easier to treat than damage to hair cells. Now what about medications? Um, we have a lot of medications that are used for treatment of the ear in various situations. Antibiotics, if you have an ear infection, of course, are fine. Um, they're, not as, they're not needed as anywhere near as much as we, we prescribe them, as you know, the physicians do, because it's been found by people who've done studies on this that if you treat an ear infection with an antibiotic, it gets better one day sooner than if you leave it alone. So, when you take a, a tile with an ear infection in, your pediatrician is now going to say, don't treat this, we'll just wait. You know, give us a day. And the parents say, no way. <laughs> you know, my child is in pain, my child's unhappy, I'm unhappy, give them antibiotics. And so they do. They, that hasn't really changed practice, but we know that they're not as effective as they should be. Um, steroids are also used for treating hearing loss, and they can be used if you have a problem that's related to inflammation. So a lot of times for sudden hearing loss and Meniere's disease where inflammation is part of the problem or can be part of the problem, physicians will prescribe those medications. Several promising drugs to protect hearing have been identified and that's one of the things that I do in my laboratory is to try and understand the process that leads to the death of cells and to find things that can block it. So we've discovered and other people have discovered quite a range of things that can uh, that can, can do this. And these are very early experimental studies, so they're not ready for the clinic or anything like that. But we are expanding our knowledge, and I think this will be coming to fruition probably in the next you know, five or 10 years. Some of the neuroactive drugs that have been tried that block certain kinds of uh, synapses in the brain can help with tinnitus. Anti-nausea drugs obviously are used to treat the symptoms of vestibular disorders, although they don't cure them. But what's happening here is that we're typically treating the entire body to try and reach just the tiny little thing that's so small, it's smaller than a match head. And we're treating the entire body to get there. And some of these drugs have side effects. So antibiotics you know, can cause nausea and diarrhea. And in a little child, that's not a good thing. Uh, steroids can cause all sorts of reactions. So they monitor you very carefully if you're on steroids because they have you know, real potentially dangerous side effects. And uh, neuroactive drugs are the same. And anti-nausea drugs, only if you take too much. Um, but it's also possible that you take these drugs and not enough is gonna get into the ear to do you any good. Maybe the effect is gonna be small or won't last very long. So our group specializes, one of our specialties in our laboratory is local drug treatment for the ear. We're trying to figure out ways to de deliver drugs to the ear that can be done 
you know, without having to treat the entire body. That way you could get higher levels of drug into the ear and you could have fewer side effects. But there are some barriers to local drug delivery. And I'm sure you know what they are. The tympanic membrane. Tympanic membrane is a wonderful structure. It, it's a sound collector, but it also protects your ears. If a bug crawls in, it's not getting across the tympanic membrane. If you've got you know, earwax in there, it doesn't go that way. You know, it either gets stuck or it comes out, and dirt and other things. Then the second barrier is the round window membrane. That protects the inner ear from things that are in the middle ear. Like if you get an infection, the round window membrane sits as a barrier. So here is the tympanic membrane, which is a barrier. Nothing will get through it. It's impermeable to water, impermeable to all drugs. So if you want to get drugs into the middle ear, you have to take a hypodermic syringe and stick it through the eardrum, which hurts. So <laughs> it's not fun. <laughs> I've never had it done, but you know, I'm told it's really not fun. Uh, and it can be done, and physicians do this all the time. You know, when they have to deliver, say, a steroid into the middle ear, they will take a, ne a needle, stick it through your eardrum, they'll put a little you know, lidocaine or something on the drum so that it doesn't feel so bad, but you know, they will just go ahead and punch it in. You can't do that in children. Children don't tolerate it. So if you want to do that to a child, you have to knock them out with general anesthesia, which has its own dangers. So it's not typically done in children. So anyway, it would be really helpful if we could apply these drugs right through the eardrum and we wouldn't have to worry about that anymore. So one of the targets for that would be, of course, otitis media, because you know, we know that treating the entire body with antibiotics is bad. It causes side effects, it causes symptoms, and it even causes uh, you know, some bacteria that are in the other parts of the body to become antibiotic resistant, and we definitely don't want that. We have enough antibiotic resistant bacteria with those problems already. Um, and as I mentioned before, otitis media is a serious problem in lots of parts of the world where they don't have access to antibiotics and physicians to deliver them, where they don't even have ENTs. You need something really simple. So we were, we, our idea was that if we could develop something that would um, deliver drugs through the tympanic membrane, it would be a big improvement over what we're trying to do now. So. We theorized that the cells of the tympanic membrane might have biological processes that would support the movement of a molecule from one side to the other. We had no idea what that process might be, and we didn't know if it existed. But we thought it was possible that that might happen. So we utilized a, a technique called phage display to see if we could identify some rare molecules that could make that journey from one side to the other. Now, phage are microscopic organisms, and they infect bacteria but you can harness their biology by engineering them to express a molecule on the outside of this tiny, tiny little structure. So this is what a bacteriophage sort of looks like. Um, it's a little rod with a little cap on the end. It goes into a bacterium and replicates itself many, many times and then bursts the bacterium and comes out and finds another bacterium to infect. So it's a, sort of like a virus for, for bacteria, only it's a little bit smaller than your average virus. And we can engineer those by putting a piece of DNA in that will encode what's called a peptide, which is a, a little like a mini protein. It's a little short string of amino acids, and they're in a different sequence. And here we have a phage that have been engineered to express three different peptides. Now what we did was we engineered a library, we constructed a library that had 10 trillion different peptides on their surfaces. Each phage had one peptide and one peptide only. It usually had like four or five copies, but there was just one particular sequence of amino acids and we had 10 trillion of them. So we thought, okay, if we had 10 trillion copies of different things, maybe one of those would attach to something in the tympanic membrane and be able to make the journey across. So what we did was we placed this library on the tympanic membranes of animals. We used rats or guinea pigs. And we wanted to see if any of those would allow the phage to go into the middle ear. And after two hours, what we did was we took the material out of the middle ear, some fluid and stuff, and then we put those into bacteria. And if there was a phage in there, they were gonna go find a bacterium, infect it, and replicate. So they could expand themselves. So this is a diagram of our little experiment. And we put 10 trillion phage on here. We looked to see if any of them can transmigrate across the tympanic membrane. 
And if a few can cross, you can then recover them, you amplify them by putting them into bacteria, and then you do this a couple more times. And pretty soon, you know, if it's going to happen at all, you're going to have a collection of these little bacteriophage that can make the turning. And we did, the short answer. We ended up with these were the phage, and these are the amino acid sequences that are coded for the characteristics of the amino acids. And we ended up with four different peptides, and then we did the experiment again, and we found one more. So we now have five peptides that can make the journey from the outside of the tympanic membrane to the inside of the tympanic membrane. We cleverly named them peptide one through five. <laughs> But you can see here that they, you know, they have some common characteristics. You know, they have sort of green ones here and blue ones here and you know, some red ones here, and those kind of line up. And these are, we, you know, we, we, we went ahead and sequenced a bunch of the DNA of these phages and randomly. And then we just put them together and then we found that they actually were just four. And then the second time we did it, we got some of these, but we got a new one. So now we have peptides one through five. Well, how well do they work? Well. What we did was we took, uh, you know, 10 to the ninth phage, which is a trillion phage again, except these were all the same one. This was all phage with peptide one. We put them on the tympanic membrane and we compared them to a phage that doesn't have a peptide. What would that do? And what we found was that after four hours, um, we were able to get a million phage inside the ear. They just migrated right through. Whereas in the case of the wild type, it was two or three made it through. And that's probably experimental contamination, I would guess, rather than real transit. We don't know. So in four hours, we can get a million of these phage in. And if we put higher concentrations on, we can get a million in in an hour. So what we have is a system that appears to be able to drag this phage particle, which is pretty big compared to a drug, across the tympanic membrane. And that provides a potential platform for delivering drugs to the middle ear. Now, we wanted to know why this was happening. Was this just sort of a passive diffusion thing that the structure made them do that? Well, no, because if we raise, if we lower the temperature of the ear to uh, four degrees centigrade, just above freezing, it stops. So it's an active biological process. Then we also wanted to know what happens if we take away the oxygen and blood flow. So we took the ears out and set them on a dish, in a dish. We kept them at room, at body temperature, but we wanted to see what happens you know, to this, and, and sure enough, it still works for about five or six hours, and that's because the tympanic membrane doesn't have a lot of blood flow. It's a pretty passive structure. But after that time, it stopped working. And uh, so again, this suggests that this is an active mechanism by which the cells are taking these particles across the tympanic membrane, just like they could potentially take drugs. And this shows all of the different peptides that we've discovered, or at least four of them. I didn't put number five in because it doesn't, it works somewhere around here. But peptide one is our clear winner. You know, that's the one that really does a nice job. So that's the one we're concentrating on. This one, you know, we put in, put it on for four hours, we get about 10,000, 20,000 in. This one we get a million. So it seems to be much, much more efficient. So what do we want to do in the future? Well. We know that these peptides will drag a bacteriophage, one of these little you know, virus-like particles through, but what would they, will they take drugs through? Um, so what we can envision is putting these peptides on either individual drugs or on packages of drugs called liposomes that can hold you know, millions of copies of the drug molecule. Um, and they would be about the same size as a bacteriophage, so they should be able to be pulled through. And we know that peptides work in animals, but what about humans? Are they gonna work in humans? Well. We develop an assay that we can use with human tympanic membrane pieces because I don't think we're gonna get any volunteers <laughs> for us to put their stuff in their ear and then take out their ears to, to do the assay. But you know, when someone's eardrum is ruptured because of an infection or damage, uh, the surgeons have to take out pieces of the eardrum that are folded over because they won't heal if there's any folding. So they cut out the little flaps and we can, you know, those are not too, too big, but you know, big enough that we can use them in an assay. And so we've developed that to uh, look at potential human transport. So this is what we think of as, as a possibility. One is individual drug molecules. Um, if you just need a million of them in there, we can do that in four hours or even one hour. But if you need more, then we can take a liposome drug carrier, each one of which contains a million molecules, and we can get a million of those in. So then we're talking you know, trillions of molecules that are getting into the ear. 
And then this is our little chamber that we devised for assaying the human tympanic membrane. We put a piece of the tympanic membrane, you know, in between some plastic pieces that have holes in them that line up. We can then put the phage on one side and see if it migrates through to the other side. And we've done that experiment not in humans yet, but we've done that experiment in rats. And this is the transport into the lower chamber. It's a 1.5 millimeter chamber, which is about the size we would need to use. And the phage that doesn't have a peptide doesn't go through the tympanic membrane, but the phage that does will go through. And that's because the transport works for several hours after the tympanic membrane is taken out. It doesn't immediately go away. So this means that we have an, uh, the opportunity to deliver drugs into the middle ear. We could do drugs, we could do gene therapy, viruses, we can do all sorts of things. And uh, that would allow us to, make, to give higher doses than can currently be given because of systemic side effects. And you know, we can probably avoid those side effects you know, altogether by having the treatment only go into the middle ear. And in the developing cut world, where you know, we don't have any ENTs to use a microscope to look in your ear, any village nurse could probably drop something like this into the ear and treat serious cases of hearing loss and rescue millions of people uh, from hearing loss. At least that's our dream. Now what about the inner ear? What about the business end where all the uh, cells are that we really want to, uh, to take care of? Our group also studies ways to get drugs into the inner ear. And now the eardrum is a very strong barrier, but the round window membrane is fairly permeable. So you can get drugs in there. And physicians already take advantage of this by injecting things like steroids into the middle ear. They can then percolate across the uh, round window membrane. Now here's what the, the place that we're going. It's right behind the eardrum. And if you look through the eardrum, make a little hole and look through, you can actually see the human round window sitting right here. It's about a millimeter in diameter. So it's a nice target for a surgeon to be able to do under a microscope. And if you look at the uh, cross section of the human round window membrane, Here's the window, the membrane we were looking at. Um, you're right in the high frequency region of the cochlea. So if you put a drug on here, it's going to have ready access to all the cells that you would want to have access to. So if we go ahead and deliver drugs directly like this by injecting them, you know, out of a little syringe onto the, the ear, into the round window membrane here, then that's going to enter through the permeable round window membrane and treat the inner ear. And that's what physicians do now. But there's a problem. The drug only contacts the window for a little time, a few hours, until you stand up off the treatment table, it starts to drain away and down through the eustachian tube. Pretty soon, there's no drug getting into the ear at all. So if you look at the you know, curve of how much drug is in the inner ear, and this is looking at a steroid, um, you can get about tw maybe six, eight hours of treatment out of one injection into the ear. So that's not very much treatment. You know, if you're taking a pill, you can be going on and on and on, you know, for days. That's kind of what you'd want to do. So how would you serve, solve this problem? Well, we've looked at that by using what's called a thermal reversible gel. And that's a, that's a gel, you know, like Jell-O, except this one is liquid at, at room temperature. And then when you put it into the body and it goes up to body temperature, it turns into Jell-O. And you can put drugs into that and you can put those onto the round window membrane and they should deliver drugs for a longer time. So here you can see a regular uh, liquid and here you can see, you know, the, and, and at 70 degrees, this is very, very liquid. But if you raise it to body temperature, it just stays exactly where it is because it's turned into jello. This is a picture of this thing. They're called hydrogels and they're mostly water. You know, they're anywhere from, you know, 1% to half a percent to 20% uh, another material, and the rest of it is all water. So you can dissolve drugs into that water or into the material of the gel itself, and that can then be delivered for long periods of time. So in that case, what we do is we inject the gels here into the round window membrane area, and then the drug is delivered for much longer periods of time. And here are some results of actual experiments. So we used a, you know, if we use a solution, I showed you those data before, less than a day, all the drug is gone. But as we increase the concentration of the gel from a half percent gel to a 20 percent gel, we can get delivery for seven weeks of the same drug. So we're able to increase that delivery 80 times more efficiently and end up with higher levels than we do if we put in a liquid. 
So this is going to be you know, something that will, I believe, revolutionize the treatment of uh, hearing disorders that we can approach with drugs. Now, what are they good for? That's the, that's the other question. One of the things we've studied is noise-induced hearing loss. And what you can see here is this is the threshold shift that you can see at different frequencies after you present a loud noise to an animal. And that's what we see up here in the purple and the green line. But if you use a steroid with the gel, then you provide significant protection, even at a 6% gel, which doesn't provide as much protection as a 20% would. So we think that we have a mechanism to protect the hair cells if they're damaged, uh, or if those cells are undergoing some kind of stress, like aging or a genetic disorder, or you're going to be treated with a drug, they could provide local protection that would keep the uh, uh, hair cells from succumbing to damage and protect hearing. So we think that long-term drug, drug delivery is feasible, and several drugs that have been shown to be effective locally for chronic and sudden hearing loss can be delivered this way. <clears throat> and we think we can get higher levels for more effective treatment and reduce side effects. Now, I have to say, today, we're only curing mice. But tomorrow, our goal is to treat people. And we think that that goal is actually very close indeed. Now, another disclosure, this one a serious one, I'm a scientific founder of a company called Autonomy, which is working to develop these hydrogels. So take everything I say with a grain of salt, because I've got a, I've got a dog in this fight. <laughs> and we're using that for delivery to the middle and inner ears. And we ac actually have clinical trials underway. And you know, I don't receive money from the company. All the work in my laboratory is funded you know, independently, because it would be a conflict of interest for me to do research on this. So this research that I'm talking about here was funded earlier by the National Institutes of Health and by the Royal National Institute for the Deaf of the United Kingdom, who are very interested in uh, the problems in the developing world. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> And I'll be happy to answer questions. <laughs>